I'm a chaos, NG, baby, I'm more unique. In the off white Rari, baby, we run the streets. I'm a chaos, NG, Westside royalty. I'm a chaos, NG, baby, that's all you need. I'm a chaos, NG, baby, I'm more unique. All right, everyone, you're with Stephen Basito on my podcast, Get It, and having a uh, guest today joining me is a uh, dear friend of mine, Mario, who is also a sports psychologist, and, you know, today we're going to really just dive into the mental side of sports. You know, we always hear so much about how you've got to train, and you've got to go to this coach, and you've got to practice with this sports-specific guy, and you've got to play in this many mm. games, and you've got to do all these different things, and, you know, unfortunately... And I'm a basketball coach and, and, you know, obviously, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about the, the overtraining, you know, the, the fact that kids are just, they're now pushed into so many things and they have, you know, the expectation level so high and kids are burning out before they even get to high school to play their sport in high school. They're switching sports or they're quitting completely. And, you know, there's just so much misinformation out there. And, you know, yeah, I'm a basketball guy, but you work with all sports. And as a strength coach, I train kids in all sports. So I have right. my foot in the door with a multitude of sports that aren't just basketball. And uh, up until, I mean, even the first couple of weeks of the quarantine time, I was still training a bunch of my NFL guys, guys for the Raiders, the Jaguars, the Redskins, the Dallas Cowboys, the Detroit Lions. I've got a couple of guys getting drafted this year. And then finally it was just like, look, obviously we all just need to stay indoors. Like, let's yeah. just cut it. But, um, you know, A, I think this is – you know, a good thing for kids, right, uh, to some aspect, like not maybe two months of sitting indoors, but getting some rest time. Like all these kids that have been like going through this grind. Yes. Or, you know, now they finally get a little bit of a break because you can't do anything for the most part. You know, you can do some stuff at home. But then, you know, even for, you know, backing up to the, to the first part of this, like let's just, you know, I, I really want, you know, people to hear from you. You are an expert in this. This is what you do. And provide us a little bit of your resume. I don't want to brag about you. So sure. You no, no, no. Yourself a little well, bit here and just tell us. I like you. it when people brag about me. <laughs> well, I will definitely do a little bit, a little bit of that through this. Um, but you know, you, you, some of the, you know, for the last time that you spoke uh, to my team's last season, you know, when you were talking about some of the guys that you're working with, there are these high level guys like the Kevin Durant and Steph Curry's, you know, I know you can't mention some of them by name, but, um, you know, that's a really intriguing thing for most people. And most people don't realize that the A-list, high-level sports guys, regardless of basketball, football, they have sports psychologists they see on their own. Every professional team has a staff of us. And you mentioned the Cowboys. I think they have like 12. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> right. That's kind of telling. But, no, um, we are now – sports psychology has become part of – the, 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 the conversation mm -hmm. um, with sports and performance, just like you would have a strength and conditioning person, just like you would have a massage or an acupuncturist or right. a nutritionist. We're now part of the team, part of the inner right. circle that, we, that constitutes a performance team that helps um, that athlete, that person get to wherever it is that they want to get to. Right. And so my job is to facilitate and to own that role, making sure that you know the muscle between the ears is as sharp, is as strong, and is serving whatever it is that the purpose is that we're all assigned to help that athlete accomplish. Right. And you know, if if you're not thinking right, the body's going to follow. And so, if you're not believing in yourself, if you're not really taking ownership of your moment, being present of committing to the work, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to allow for distractions to kind of, kind of filter in. And then it's going to impact the quality of the workout, which over an extended period of time is going to affect the quality of your work, sure. which is at the pro level going to determine whether or not you got a raise right. or you get a release form that says, nice knowing you, yeah. you're now unemployed. Well, you know, now, so I, I grew up hearing the term my whole life, sports is 90% mental. That's yeah. weird, that literally coaches would say that. I don't even think they knew what that meant. That was right. just what they would say. And then it's like, as a kid, I'm like, well, 
what do I do with that? Like you, you've told me sports is 90% mental. So cool, man. What does that mean? And then that was kind of the end of it. Like sports is yeah. 90% mental and they walk away. And you're, I'm just you know, like, okay, give me the basketball. I'm going to go play again. You know, like I just, it, there's, it just washes over my head. And, and I talked to, you know, obviously I talked to my kids about it. I talked to parents about it too, but I really explain what that means, you know, but most people don't know what it means. So please, you know, no. you know and, exactly and, what sports is. Tell us what is sports like on the mental side? Is it 90% mental? And then maybe walk us through what that saying even means a little bit. So people have a better context to that. Wow. There's so much that wants to, I just want to, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I need, I need to take a breath and I need to go s- slow baby steps here. Yeah. Uh, how much of, of sports is mental? Yeah. Listen, you have to have talent, but if you got talent and you got a mental midget, you got somebody who's not getting drafted. Right. You got somebody who's, who's not going to reach their potential. You got somebody who's a liability. Right. And so uh, is it 50, 50? I, I don't know if I know the exact, but I think it's a sliding scale. I think the more talent you have, uh, you probably get away with not being as sharp up there. Okay. You know, but if you got no talent, well, all right, what's, what's offsetting that? Right. You better be a gritty son of a gun. Yeah. You better be sharper. You better have a, a, a better sport IQ than your opponent. You better know how to know how to define a will to win and then to beat them in some other way, as opposed to I'm going to quit. I'm going to check out because I've been defeated Mm -hmm. before I either, you know, step on the court. I take a swing of a bat. I ever, I I, I even make one attempt or in some of the cases of the fighters, you know, I I throw one punch, you know, you've got, you've got to believe that you belong there. Then you've got to, believe in the work. You can't be short-sighted. You got to be, you, you got to be committed to the grind. Yeah. And that's where I think you start developing mental toughness. Now you mentioned, you know, all these different populations. I think if you got it, you got it. It comes out. It's, it's almost like, okay, you got the Kobe's, you got the Michael's, you got the LeBron's. You, you, you just see it as soon as they step on the court. You see it in their demeanor. You see it in their body language. You see it in their eyes. You see it in how they um, respond to a mistake. Mm-hmm. So there's patterns that are there. Well, how do you learn that? You either are fortunate enough to have been coached by somebody who embraces that knowledge and, and owns it and then mentors appropriately, or you've had parents who can teach them. And that's a rare thing. Because as you and I know, you know, a lot of our work is working with parents and trying to coach them and, 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 and advise them right. on what to do as much as what not to do. Right. And I think as parents, and you and I both are parents, I think there's a learning curve that has to happen where you, you hopefully learn through your failure and you realize what I need to stop doing. Right. So I don't repeat this cycle. And I expose my kid my players my athletes to this idea of failure is a teachable moment right so the more you fail the more you give that kid a chance to learn and sometimes the lesson is not for you to share or you to preach the lesson is for them to sit in their mess yeah and take ownership of it and say all right i i don't like this yeah and <laughs> i'm you, always telling parents like let your kids if your kids fail just be a be a you know or succeed just be a board for them let them talk and you don't need to coach them like that's what you're paying us to do as coaches yes. i think for you sports so many parents think that they know better than the coach and it's like you know listen if you're playing like rec sports that's probably a true statement because those coaches are parents too they're not some of them never even played the sport before but they're just coaching because they want their kid to play and they know that if they don't coach there's kids aren't going to play not just their kid but a bunch of kids right so they all volunteer yes. Right. Yes. So I think that that's awesome. Right. And kudos to those parents, you know, but if you're a parent trying to get your kid, you know, like you're like, Hey, we want our kid to, you know, possibly maybe go the college route. We see that could happen. Well, then that's why club sports is so important. Right. Because now you're getting yeah. people that typically not always, but typically they mm-hmm. have some knowledge of the sport they play, they can, you know, help. And then you can kind of evaluate objectively. But I think so many times parents are the, 
one of the bigger issues. You know, they are mm-hmm. one of those roadblocks. And I mean, no just with all the all the college coaches I talked to, it was funny because West Point, um, their head coach just texted me this morning, and he said, "Hey, man, you know, I, was, I hope you guys are staying safe and everything. I know it's been a little while, but do you got anybody in the pipeline for us for next year?" And I said, "Man, it <laughs> meets your standards. Like, yeah, I might have a couple kids that might get to D one, but they're not, you know, academically. And I mean, you're not looking at these." No, I was like, I don't think anybody that's going to fit your guys' mold. Because I had a kid last year, and they yeah. came out and, and looked at him and everything, and this kid is a killer. And the thing, you know, going back to just the mental side of things, like this kid, mentally, he has it. Like, mm. he's laser-focused. I think the biggest shift for him, which is another mental thing, is like, he plays for me, he starts, he plays almost every minute, he's like a, a, an impact player. Mm. And like, we've won some games against kids that were already signed to you know power five conferences and he's put put in work on them and you know they came and they watched the game and it was a good game but i don't they kind of left early and you know and then I, that kind of messes with them a little bit i just say hey, look man like they, they don't have us you know they gotta look at a bunch of kids you're good but then he goes back to his school and he's not starting you know he's like a six man or a seven man and even if he's a team captain like he kind of gets you know and then his mental side really yes. and his grades suffer and his mom's calling you know it's just crazy but um yeah you know that uh the, the parents, you know, is just one of the other things that, that coaches, they'll ask me about too. And, and it's a common thing now, like, hey. Absolutely. Know, yeah, this kid, all right, tell me about the parents of this kid. And I was like, yes. Okay. And, and that's why a lot of times, like, if parents are a problem, I'll just say, hey, look, man, this is the situation. This is where we're at. This is where I need you to be. And if you can't be in this space, then – you know, I, I'm not even the right club for you because I can't help your kid because no. coaches are going to ask me about you. And, and if you lie, right now, you're not giving your me your reputation's good, done. Yeah. I'm like, dude, and you're not giving me a good selling point for you guys. And I don't, in the, that, like you said, relationships are so critically important. Yes. I will not ruin my relationships that I've spent years building Correct. over a player. Like, look, if you're not committed to the cause and you're not going to do things, then go the JC route. I've got, I've got mm-hmm. right now seven to eight kids that should all be playing Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA. They're all going junior college. And a big part of it, maturity. Yeah. Um, the There's a reason why the season exists. Side. Yeah, and parents. You know, for some of them, it's strictly the parents. I'm like, dude, I'm not – I can't vouch for you, some of these coaches. Because I've gotten calls, and I'm like, look, it's not – you know, the kids are mature or there's, there's stuff going on at home, like – let them go the JC route for a year or two. I'll let yes. them know you're interested. You should talk to them, but just understand, like, I can't, I can't put my name to the kid and say, yes, he deserves to, or she deserves to play at your program. Because at the end of the day, man, if it doesn't work out, that relationship is severed and I'm in trouble now. And it's funny, our egos as parents get in the way. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Duke's not calling. What's the matter with them? Well, well, they're not calling because your kid's not good enough. Yeah. Now, does that mean that your kid can be someday? Yeah. I don't want to, sh- you know, I don't want to blow up the dream, but right. let's be realistic here because there's a difference between being realistic and pie in the sky. Right. And if, if Duke's not calling, but you're getting calls from a Cal State Fullerton or, right. you know, uh, um, you know, Milwaukee of the Wabash, well, then that's probably a good indicator that that's where your kid is right? from a talent standpoint. So let them thrive there because they could always step up. Or right. let's, let's have them go to the JC. You get two to three years to develop, to grow, to acclimate yourself physically to the game, right. to understand the demands because those kids are not ready. Right. Well, and, you're and then right to you really want to make the mistake of truly failing – going to a program where not only are you getting crushed physically, but then you start letting that, again, now we're going back to the mental part of the sports and being an athlete. You start sulking. You start checking out. You start not going 100% in practice. It affects your ability to stay focused in class. Right. And now you get in trouble. And now you've got to start a letter because you're going to be asked to leave. 
because you're you're probably going to be um, your own worst enemy. Right. And now you're going to go back to your hometown, having failed, and not having had the teachable moment, the perspective that you should have. Right. You're going to be bitter. Your parents should be bitter, and you're going to be one of those fan, one of those one of those players who, you know, woe is me. The world was evil to me. It's like no, you got what you deserved. Let me ask you a question. So. You know, with your son, you know, he went to Eastern Washington, he gets a scholarship mm -hmm. to play, and then he left. What was, walk us through that a little bit, because, you know, I, I know we've spoken on a little bit, but I, didn't, I don't even know the full story of what. So here's, so here's the fascinating thing. Tremendous high school basketball player, top, top, top 100 in the country, ESPN ranked everything, um, went through a series of injuries. Um, tremendous high school career, um, but because of those injuries, the phone calls started becoming fewer and fewer. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the um, level of offers started dropping. And so long story short, he ended up going to D3 school. It's now a D2 school. Crushed it. We had a good relationship with that coach. He knew him since he was a kid. He knew us. And he was like, I don't know what he's doing, but if he doesn't have home, I'd love to have him. As a parent, you hear that, you're like, wow, how lucky are we that somebody really wants our kid? Mm -hmm. That is a great lesson for pe people to know. He had a phenomenal freshman year. Right. Um, arguably one of the best freshmen that he's ever had the blessing of coaching, and it was reciprocal. My son felt tremendous loyalty to this man because he believed in him. And he ex had the bar high, he's kind of getting mad. Um, then over the course of the year, he starts saying, you know what? I think I could flex my muscles again. I'm healthy. I had a really good year. I think I want to go play D1. Okay. You know, it's not my decision. It's his choice. We right. supported it. Um, uh, it it's, but it's hard to find a home and hard to find a home going from D3 to D1 right. if you're not an All-American. So you're going to be shelling a little bit of money out of your own pocket. So long story short, he ends up going there. It's three years, and yes, he played, but unfortunately now it's, again, relationships, and it's a business, mm -hmm. and it is a different type of business, and depending on who you're playing for, the relationship can be very different. It may not be mentor-player. It could be businessman. Um, asset. Asset. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can't get the most out of this asset, then you're replaceable. Yeah. And that was the experience he had there. So, and, and that's probably the best way I can describe it without getting personal. Right. Um, so, um, body started shutting down again. And part, part of that is because he worked so hard. There's a, there's a book that I'm trying to develop and it's the, and it's the concept of detachment where you learn how to care without caring. Right. I think you probably understand that because you can right. care too much and yeah. then you get in your own way. Yes. You cannot care at all. And then you become a little bit of a cancer. Yeah. But if you have the right balance where, listen, I know what I'm doing, but I'm playing for the right reasons. I don't care what you think. I'm going to go and focus to my job. That's the sweet spot. Yeah. And so he ended up coming back here and um, um, another former coach that he knew heard that it wasn't going well, stayed in touch because of his high, high character, good reputation, good family, and f gave him a home. And he finished up down here. So what university? Uh, Vanguard. Vanguard. Uh, yeah. To play. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, I texted some, some pictures too. It was, and you know, it was really fun getting to watch him. Uh, you can tell. As it was for us, because it was in our backyard, you yeah. know? Well, you could just tell he was having fun, you know, and, and Rhett is a phenomenal. And actually, I've texted Rhett a couple of times. I'm like, Rhett, I want you on my podcast. He's like, you know, okay, we'll talk, you know. But I love phenomenal Rhett. Human being. Rhett is such a amazing – I won't just say coach because he is an amazing coach, but he's an amazing man, leader. Yes. You know, going back yes. to that whole, like, mentor, mentee, Rhett takes yes. that, that role with – all of his kids. I mean, he really invests in each of them as a mentor and he's preparing them for life. You know, and I've hired a half dozen Vanguard players over the years. Right. Coach camps, clinics, teams, all that kind of stuff. And every single one of them, you know, nobody ever has a bad thing to say about the guy. 
which is good. You know, before I even really knew Red, I actually had a couple of Vanguard kids working for me. I just asked them about him. I was like, hey, you know, is he like a good coach? Is he a good guy? Like, yeah. how do you treat yeah. you guys and stuff? Because for me, you know, as a coach, our number one, in my point of view, our number one responsibility is to grow and flourish young men and young women. Yes. Right. We're supposed to invest in them. It's not about, look, my career is over. I don't need to win. You know, if I never win another game the rest of my life, is it going to really, is it going to destroy me? No. I mean, it's, I'm, I don't like to lose. Right. But at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about, did I help these kids grow into young men and women and that better their life? And right. you're all, look, unless you're playing pro and it's a business, and I, I recognize college is a business. And obviously I was a college athlete, so I get that. But like, that's part of the problem, right? It shouldn't be just so solely focused as business. There still should be that aspect of you should be building up these kids because a lot of them aren't going to play pro and they need to go flourish in the world. And Rhett does such a great job of that balance yes. and, and really helping <clears throat> young men prepare for the real world. And I still maintain relationships with some of those guys and they're all doing well, you know, and a lot of it came from that, those years they played for Rhett that they were, um, you know, because Rhett gets a lot of transfers too and stuff. He doesn't just get kids out of high school. Right. And he really makes those impacts in those young men's lives. And even, and to your point, even with transfers, you know, guys who will just say, let's say, if you're a JC transfer, typically there's this, this, this stigma, all right, they, they're coming with baggage. Well, right. he'll take them. And he'll still mentor them yep. in spite of baggage. Yep. In fact, I think he looks at that as maybe a challenge. My job, it remind, they remind me of what my job is. Right. It isn't just to coach the talented kid. It's to coach everybody because I need for them to be prepared for life after basketball. Yep. And sports at some point comes to a halt, yep. either on your terms or life's terms. And I think this coronavirus thing has forced us to have to take – you know, pump the brakes, in fact, slam the brakes on and yeah. look at the reality that, uh, um, you know, that is life and that is sports. It cannot be this priority. Now, if you want to be great, okay, there's a price you pay. I get it. You, and, and we have to be willing to embrace and accept that. But what is our real identity? Right. You know, not everyone's going to be a Kobe. Not everyone's going right. to be a LeBron. Okay. Right. So, you got to find you got to find your your you know where you are in this spectrum, and then you also need to ask yourself what's my what's what's not Plan B, but what's my next chapter for my life? Right. You know, it is not your bas your identity is basketball. Your identity is pro football. You're right. No, that's that's what you do for a job. Yeah, but you know, it's so hard. Like I even struggled, like because my career did not end on my terms. It mm -hmm. ended my injuries. Mm -hmm. And I was really looking forward to playing overseas professionally. Like I knew I wasn't going to play in the NBA, but I knew I was going to be able to get paid and play somewhere else in another mm -hmm. country. If I kept, you know, growing at the rate I was and, and developing, at least I, that was what my dream was. Right. Maybe, right. maybe it's, maybe that's not realistic, but that's what my dream was. And I felt like I could achieve that. But uh, yeah, when all that came crashing down, you know, to a halt and an end for me, I struggled for years. Oh yeah. For years. My oh, yeah. first year mm -hmm. that I actually was even, I didn't, I had to forfeit my scholarship because it was contingent on me being at the school and being able to play my junior year. And I, I remember like when that all settled and I was like, you know, it's, it's okay. I'm going to get back in, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to train, I'm going to re, you know, I'm going to repair all the injuries and mm -hmm. recover. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in better shape than I ever was. I'm going to be, you know, a year down and I'm going to be able to go right back into it. And, you know, seeing a bunch of my teammates who I was really close to, they were all continuing their careers and stuff. And, you know, so after work every day, I go work mm -hmm. out in the gym for an hour doing weights and I go play basketball for an hour and a half, two hours. I go shoot whatever I needed to do. And, and then as I got into my next university and I started getting ready, you know, I was, running through tryouts and stuff and, and, and running through things with the guys at central Washington and a couple of my like, kids that came in after I left, they had gotten full scholarships to play and they both left 
and they quit mm. really. And it was because of the coach. And I talked to more guys and they're like, yeah. And after that, I was like, then my depression really hit. I was like, dude, I was so bummed out. I felt like well, maybe depression is not the right word, but I went through an identity crisis. No, I'm glad you did use that word because I think as men, we don't like that word. It scares us. But anybody who's gone through this peak and valley of sports, because it's, it's a roller coaster. Yeah, it is. It's, it's not a hockey stick. No, oh. no. It's, it is a love-hate roller coaster ride. Yeah. And that bottom of the hill can be as emotionally painful as, any, as, as a death. Because in some ways, once the sport stops, it is a death. It, there's a partial death of us. Right. And so either we stay in grieve mode. Right. Or we finally work through it and say, okay, there's also a rebirth now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a purpose to your life after sports. I think so many people don't understand Mm -hmm. that. You know, I deal with that with some of my athletes where their sports have ended, especially right now, right? Where their senior year, this is, you know, for spring sports, especially this is their chance to get their scholarship solidified. And now they don't even know if they're going to get it. You know, and I've talked to a few of those kids and you can hear that they, you know, the amount of concern, you know, and it, it is, I, I totally get it. Like, you know, and I've told them like, look, believe me, there's life after this. You're going to be okay. But it's really hard. Are you it's froze. Really I'm frozen. All right. So we had a little technical difficulty, Kevin. <laughs> Why don't you work your magic here? So let's hop back into where we were talking here. So um, where were we? you know, the identity, right? And so it's, oh, it, yes. like, like it can be as devastating as a, as a death. And I, you know, and again, this goes partially back to the mental side of it, right? Like you invest your whole life in this. And I grew up, you know, lower, low middle income, whatever you want to say. But um, like my whole identity was wrapped up into something I thought was going to better my life, better my family's Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Better opportunity. I love the game. And there's a lot of that too, right? Like, I mean, the stats are what, like 0.001% of athletes make it to be professional. I mean, it's. But think about how much of your life you devoted to this. Right. Then as you grow up, depending on your household, weekends are now spent with, you know, the traditional sport family, traveling to a tournament, traveling to watch. You're spending maybe a weekend in a hotel in another city. You're on the road you're all so invested mm-hmm. in this experience almost to a fault. Yeah. To a fault. That's where that idea of detachment really starts coming in and taking on some meaning for those who are willing to see it and to recognize it and acknowledge it. Right. Cause most people are, we're here, we're here until you have the aberration yeah. until you have the coronavirus of sport that forces you to, to slam on the brakes in the form of an injury right. in the form of, you know, a new kid moves into town and they're the stud and right. then your kid falls down in the pecking order. Um, a change of coach, uh, whatever the case is, right. Most people aren't prepared to deal with it. Right. So how do we build on mental toughness? We got to learn how to embrace and deal with adversity better. Mm-hmm. Most of us as parents, don't do a good job of allowing our kids to deal with adversity. And what's the way that people can, you know, for parents that are seeing this, what's some ways that they can help, right? So any of those things, any of those scenarios you just named, injury, (laughs) a new kid moves to town, a new coach, your kid gets bumped down a little bit, like how can parents not only walk through that themselves, Mm. right? but then how can they help their kids walk through that too? Well, I think we, we've got to remember that kid, we, we need to model the behavior we want our kids to be able to eventually take on as adults and as eventual as parents or influencers. Right. And so we got to make sure that, that perspective matters. It's not the end of the world. Okay. It may be the end of this chapter in their life, but you're still writing your biography. Right. Okay. So um, we can't take it so seriously where it's life and death. Right. Blow on ACL. Okay. It'll get fixed. Now have some perspective. Um, it could be so much worse. Right. Okay. Right. And, and, and you don't really know that again until you have the aberration where your kid maybe gets hurt 
and now you're really feeling your your heart is just ripped out because you're seeing little Billy or little Sally sitting watching their friends play. Yeah. Can't do anything about that. Right. And the last thing you should do is try and shortcut that timeline for the body to heal. Yeah. I have a kid, I have an athlete I spoke with this morning and she's back in Texas and, and she said, Hey coach, how you doing? Just checking in. Everything's going great. And I said, oh, listen, I, and I sent her a post and I said, um, I'm expecting you be for you next year to be on this all American team. Um, she had a couple injuries, didn't let her body heal. She was own worst enemy. And um, she tells me, yeah, this time has been really good to be home, to work out, be with my family, let my body rest. Um, and then, you know, I asked her, I said, have you ever gotten your, have you gotten your shoulder looked at? She goes, no, I haven't scheduled that MRI yet. So here's somebody who could, should be taking advantage of this downtime. Right. And right. like so many of us, we're afraid of the truth. Right. I don't want to know. I kind of want to, but I don't want to know. Well, so put you got downtime out. now. So, like, if you're going to find out, find out now and start recovering. Thank you. Yes. And so there's an example where we, we, we self-sabotage. Right. You know? Right. And, again, that's some of that's maturity. And some of that is also being surrounded by people who kind of know a little bit, who've been through this right. journey. So, um, you know, every year you got a whole new set of uh, – neophyte parents and athletes that right. come into the sports world right because another one's checking out it's yep. just a revolving door oh 100 so critical is, right sports is just yeah. a revolving door you're always gonna have kids coming through the ranks you always have people aging out injuring out quitting whatever it is and that's why it's so vital to have good experienced people who've been there like you to be truth tellers yeah and it and not and it not be just about the money now should you get paid? Absolutely. You know, there's a value to what you do, but we need to find a way to be able to help you be and your voice be heard and seen right before the shysters. Dude. Well, that's the thing, right? Like now everybody can just click on YouTube and you're going to see a million shysters and one sound voice. And that's really what the problem is, right? You're competing against all these people. Yes. That, you know, wrong motives, yes. wrong, whatever it is. Right. And it, it is challenging. You know, I, I've, you know, we've talked a few times just about my own personal, like, uh, mental beatings and mm -hmm. getting through life a little bit. And, uh, you know, it can be so draining. You really have to have a balance, yes. and, you know, and I tell my friends who are coaches, I'm like, dude, you also have to learn to give yourself grace, which is something yes. I never gave myself. And I finally started doing it. And being like, look, I'm not perfect. A, things are going to happen. They're out of my control. B, and I can take responsibility for what I am responsible for. But at the end of the yes. day, it's nobody's like, this isn't, nobody's going to die over this, right? It's a sport. You're not going to lose a game and go out to the back parking lot and get shot for it. And I just try and tell families like, look, man, you, you know, it's, it's very easy to be in your shoes where you can just criticize everybody. No. But try to understand, like, everybody's trying their best. People aren't coming here to just – they don't know that, who your kid is. They're not coming here, oh, man, I've got this kid at 9 a.m. I'm going to make sure I screw him. Like, come on, man. The refs, they're just trying to make a couple extra bucks. Yeah. They're spending their weekends doing something. that You have to have the refs if you want to have games. If there's no refs, there's no games. So don't abuse the refs. You know, the right. scorekeeper, they're a human being. They're not perfect. Yes, they're going to make a mistake here and there. Just – politely to say, hey, ref, the scorekeeper gave the wrong two points to the other team. You know, it was, you know, it'll all work. They work it out. There's directors there. There's scorekeepers. There's and you got a better oh, chance of getting a change that way yeah, than saying, hey, you blankety, blankety, blankety idiot. Yeah. Ta-da. <laughs> I know, man. It's, it's You're human. Yeah. And, man, I've had to break up fights before, you know, and kick people out. It's just like, dude, all over, like, we're talking, this is even from high school. We're talking about kids that are like your kids fourth 12. graders, fifth graders. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you all fighting over? You're not even in high school yet. Like, let's relax. It's a game. They're going to play three more this weekend. But you, again, you don't know what you don't know. Oh, I know. It's crazy. And, and, and listen, I've learned through my own trials and tribulations. And it's, it's fascinating to see the journey where I am now. Right. And where I was. 
Right. I, I remember being in a tournament way back when, confessional here, and it was in Arizona. And I was one of those dads who almost got into a fight with a dad who was at the, all the way at the other end of the court. And I'm like, why is this? And, and, and we, I come from a place of you know, following rules, black and white. Listen, right. guys, just, just follow the rules. That kid should not be talking to our kids. You know, that's the, just have them sit where the parents are. And when, when you see that, all of a sudden, it is easy to get caught up in the emotion right. and our identity. And again, to your point, it's a game. Yeah. It really is. Why, why are they playing the game? Yep. Why are you sitting in the stands? What's your job? cheerleader yep not enforcer yep. <laughs> that's the zebra guy yep shut up and cheer your kid and uh, we get so caught up in all the wrong things that we we need guys like you and me to take a breath and show them this is why we do this yep and if you can't buy in uh, listen, you probably need to go someplace else, but I'm hoping you don't go because I really care about your kid and the experience. And the last thing you want, mom and dad, is to be that parent that creates such a toxic environment and and series of memories that when the kid goes to college or when that kid continues to play, they won't want you there in the stands. Yeah, well, there's some parents that their kids told them they wouldn't play if their parents were there. I mean, I know some of those kids, you know, it's crazy. Not necessarily for basketball, but just for sports in general. Um, yeah, it's, it is, it's hard, though, you know, because it's your kids. So you're, like, invested in a different way. But I tell my wife the same thing, like, dude, look, we're going to watch our daughter. Whatever happens, happens. And we're just going to love on her and support her. And we're not going to say nothing. And you're not going to tell anybody that I'm a coach. You're not going to tell anybody that I run. A, you're, you're going to say nothing about what I do. As far as you're concerned, you can tell people that I am a stay-at-home husband, which currently <laughs> pretty much mm. am. It's like, I don't care what you tell people. Just don't tell them that I'm involved in sports because I don't want people coming to ask me for my opinion. I don't say nothing. Like, you yeah. don't still watch my high school kids play at their high schools and the parents going like, oh, this coach is wrong. You know, it's like, listen, I love you guys. Your kids are going to play for me soon enough. I can't control their people. They're doing what they're doing. I don't know their story. Let's just let them look. It is what it is, right? We're not going to sit here and gang up on a, you know, just let them play. It'll all yeah. itself out. Just relax. But it's hard. I, mean, I see it's hard. So the, the, I think the ch interesting challenge right now will be um, seeing the gift that coronavirus and this, you know, forcing to have to stay in. Um, is actually presenting to us as parents, to us as coaches, and even to the athletes. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what is it that really matters? Yeah. Our life, our, our yeah. livelihood, our health, our family. Yeah. Let's reshuffle our priorities. I think that's huge. That's Number two, um, start sharpening the swords. How about the one between the ears? Mm -hmm. Use YouTube for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Can you still practice your craft? Absolutely. Be creative. Um, you're younger than I am, but when we were kids, we didn't have internet. When we were kids, we didn't grow up on YouTube watching things. Oh, you had to go YouTube. out and, and figure stuff to go. Yeah. And there was no YouTube yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> up that loud noise and oh, it's crazy. Yeah. They're, like, YouTube How do you get better? So much you, later. you went out and you found creative ways to sharpen your craft well, you, just, you did you know, stuff by yourself played lots of sports too right like i don't i never played like yeah i played basketball as often as i could but i grew up in a small mm -hmm. town it was only offered it for as a winter sport so i played football in the fall i played roller hockey i played baseball with my friends like we'd all play basketball together you know but like i just remember always playing like i played tennis racquetball baseball i did not play soccer football i mean we would just you know and, and all these different sports and just because I just enjoyed playing sports in general. And we, we'd always right. go figure out, you know, ways to go, you know, do things and um, be active. But uh, yeah, like this whole, and look, I obviously have a year round club. We go, mm -hmm. from, you know, year round, but I mean, I don't sit here and tell people you've got to be involved year round until you get, you know, like the kids are and parents are serious. I'm telling them, like, look, 
once you get to like eighth grade, all right, exactly. then go for the year, right? Because at the exactly. you know you go year, maybe even seventh grade. We'll say you know year round's fine. You know if you're gonna play another sport, it's not a big deal. But you know we'll we'll work it out and and then you know get you ready for high school and all that. So, but yeah, I mean if you're if you're trying to play college, like then yes, high school it needs to be more considered year round because there's just too many. Yeah. Teams. But 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 not but to your point, not until they're eighth grade, yeah, freshman. That's when you can. That's when you can start committing to it. Yep. And listen, if it's the kid's choice and they're that wired, then sometimes the opposite has to happen. You tell them, "I want you to keep doing what you're doing," but dial it back. Yeah, let your body heal. Yep. You know, because recover rest of recovery is, a, is a, a, another critical component that I think again we forget. Parents, we forget because we're too into it. Um, the athlete certainly at that age doesn't have a healthy perspective or knowledge. So yeah. we need to seek information, but through a filter and a lens that provides the balance. Do you think part of it too, like going back to the parent thing, do you think that now because there's so many parents only have one kid, do you notice that it's more like the parents only have one kid, they're much more involved in versus they have five kids? Because you have five kids right? Yeah, and all playing point. sports, that's really hard to be that invested in every single kid because there's five of them. Like, I just have one kid. And like, yes, I mean, we wanted more, but it is what it is. But yeah, so we're more laser focused yeah. on her. But I'm like, dude, if I had two or three kids, there's no freaking way I'm going to be able to be on this one like I have been because yeah. there are three of them. No, you're man a man oh, to a point that you have to break out in the zone. <laughs> pulling my hair out with three kids, but you can't focus on just one child. But it's good. In a way, it's good. My sister has three girls. They're all tremendously athletic. And this was the year where she had to learn who does, whose game do I not attend? Right. Who, 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 which neighbor is going to help me do the carpool? Right. It's, you know, because Sienna can't, I can't be with Sienna. She needs a ride. Right. And, and I want her to continue playing. So um, you have to learn to give up control. Well, do you and think that that's easier for parents to have more than one kid? I think it's think better. It's better, yeah. I think it's better. And I think, you know, like every valuable lesson, there's a little bit of discomfort that has to happen. Right. Or you come through the other side and realize, okay, it's actually not bad. Yeah. And I'll manage things and my kids will understand, yeah, mom and dad can't be there. Mm -hmm. But when they are there, they're really there. Yeah. You know? And I'm going to treat everybody the same. I'm not going to have a favorite because the oldest one is the most talented. Right. So there's a, there's a good trickle down effect that happens in the dynamic of the home as right. a result of having to go through that, that discomfort. So, you know, one thing I, and I, know, and I never get a chance to ask this, but who are some of the most elite high level athletes that you have worked with that are not playing pro sports more? Cause I know you have to have confidentiality with ones mm -hmm. that currently are. So can you name some of the ones that have played and are no longer playing? Are you allowed to say, hey, I worked with this guy or this woman? Uh, Josh Childress, who's no longer playing basketball anymore. I think his younger brother is now coaching. I think he's helping him. Okay. Um, he was one of the first guys who went overseas and broke the bank. And, I mean, really um, started the trend of American athletes, American players going overseas and realizing, man, I can make some good money here. Right. Um, Oh man, so what's Seth's last name? I got a major, major league player who's no longer playing, but like you, he's coaching and he's 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 working with younger athletes. Um, it's weird because some of my most famous athletes, they're still they're still in it. They're still playing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which isn't bad. Um, but but it's it's interesting because. The sports world has kind of taken a pause. Yeah. And in, in my world, you know, I, I, I've been lucky that I've been kind of, I've had a diverse stable of clients, mm -hmm. not just basketball, not just football, not just MMA. Mm -hmm. And that has served me. Mm -hmm. And now I work with a lot of first responders. So really? you know, somebody was asking me this morning, you know, hey, how are things going? And, I, and I, I had to be honest. I told him, I said, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's shifted but I'm still, I'm still busy. My phone's still ringing and I'm still doing work. It is really more stress now related, stress management related as opposed right. to sport and performance. But truth is it's one of the same. Right. 
It's learning how to manage you right. so that you can accomplish your task and do the best you can. And th in those cases, it's learning how to, we don't have to tell them how to do the job. They know how to do that. It's learning how to let go of the job. The right. game's over now. Don't yeah. bring it home. Yeah. I know that was one thing that I really had to change for myself just as a coach, you know, and, and, you know, I can't let, I hate to say, I can't let a loss come in the house with me, you know, like my does, wife, there's one day she texts me and she's like, are you behind the garage? Cause I'd opened the garage, but I hadn't got out of my car yet. I stayed in my mm -hmm. car for a few minutes. And she texted me, she's like, are you on the phone or something? I said, no, I'm not on the phone. And she says, why are you in your car? <laughs> back as like, I'm working out something. I'll be in in a minute. And it's like, you know, cause for her and for my daughter, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to come in in a grumpy mood and have. Yeah, no, no. And, and, and she's and probably relieved that you have an electric car. Right. So the I, garage is closed and yeah, there's still running. I just sit in the car and, you know, I do what I need to do, whatever that may be, whether it's just closing my eyes and breathing for a few minutes and relaxing or maybe making a Good. couple of calls real quick and just getting it out. Um, well, they're in, they're in lives of the economy of, of being a coach, the world of coaching and why coaching is so stressful. We oh, learn more from our losses, but those losses hurt. Those losses keep us up at night. Those losses age us. Yeah. Those losses. I'm 38, and I've got white and gray hairs all over the place now. My wife keeps giving me, you know, um, she keeps trash. She's like, man, you're getting some wisdom, aren't you? I'm like, dude, it's these freaking kids, man. Yeah, my forehead is much larger than what it was last year. With your, Every year it gets higher and higher. Yeah. But, you know, that's the one thing that I always really focus on. I mean, you know, I can't speak for others, but for myself, I just, I don't want my work and what I do, right? Because I choose to do this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm making bank off of coaching. You know, I get paid nothing to, high, to be a high school coach mm -hmm. for the high school I'm at. I get paid, you know, very little for my club. I make more just from the tournaments. But, um, you know, it really is that uh, just letting it go. You know, I, one of the things... I always tell my wife I hate it too. Is like I've told her before. Like when I tell you, you know, you're gonna ask me how things go. I'm gonna tell you. Do not apologize because that's my like one pet peeve. When I like tell her, she's like, "I'm so sorry." It's like, don't say sorry. That's what gets me up here. <laughs> I'm like, look, I'm gonna tell you. You can hug me. You can leave the room. Just don't say you're sorry. You you can't do anything about it. That's like my pet peeve. Just don't do it. And, but I'm really good. I'm really good about just letting it go. I can work it out in the car or on my ride home or whatever it is, you know, and thankfully I don't lose yeah. a whole lot. So it's not like something I have to deal with every day, but you know, the coaching at Calgary this last year, that was a real, real big growth for me as a coach good because for you. I went into a situation I had zero control over. I didn't get to pick my team. I had six kids, five freshmen, one sophomore playing JV basketball. We're playing teams with seniors, predominantly right. juniors, you know, like at least JV, it's heavy juniors, heavy sophomores. I've got heavy freshmen, you know, and I got, I picked up a couple of kids after we won those first two games starting our season off. And, you know, but the most amount of kids I've had was nine. I had four games with nine kids. I always had kids that were hurt or sick and all, you know, five freshmen, three sophomores, one junior. Uh, you know, they all had different strengths and weaknesses, but no club kids, you know, really had to work through things. And so, you know, I started my season off tough, man. We, we played in two massive tournaments that were just brutal competition. And we weren't winning those games. It just wasn't going to happen. We, and, you know, I, I was so proud. I hate losing, but I was so proud of my guys because they worked so hard and they never gave they up. They did. They did. And I just, you know, I just took it as like, look, if the scoreboard doesn't reflect a win, they play like they're champs, though. And that's what we focused on. And we trained hard. And then to go through into league, you know, after a rough preseason, because I think we were like four and – let's see, we were four and nine going into okay. the season. I do not do well with having a losing record. I don't usually have those. So that was a really good growth for me, you know, and having to be really focused on the positive – and really just focused on the kids and just look positively invest in them, positively invest in them, train them, coach them, develop them. You know, there's a lot of freshmen that are going to play for me next year. And then getting that chance to see, you know, not wavering from my game plan. And that's the other thing, like as a coach, this internal war 
at least if you care that you go through every day, well, am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing something else? Like, where are we struggling? You know, and always reevaluating. But I just stuck with the game plan. I'm like, look, I know how to do this. I know how to win games. I know how to coach kids. And then going into our league and getting second place, beating the only undefeated team in their house the week that league was over, you know, getting all these victories in life and, and setting all new records and having, you know, at the end of the season, I think we ended up being, gosh, man, I think we're, 10 and 13 after the season was over which isn't bad for starting off so bad right but uh you know finally seeing like we achieved all these really good goals and we should have freaking won every game but you know going back to it what you should have done and what happened aren't always because you can't control injuries you can't control when kids are hurt you can't control when kids are sick you can't control when you only have six kids i only had six kids for like Ah oh, man, four or five of my league games. But think of what you did. Three of them. Think of what you did. Yeah, I remember but- one of Ben Howland's uh, assistants who was from San Diego, started off as high school, college, then went back down to um, college, and then I think went back to high school. And I remember a conversation we had. This was, wow, a long time ago, 20 years ago maybe. Um, and he said, my greatest memories were as a high school coach. I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, that's where you learn your craft. That's when it's still fun. That's when you're really mentoring and you're, you're, you're shaping that kid who's a sponge and listens to everything. Yep. That changes a lot, especially oh, when yeah. you're in a major college program. Yep. And, um, and, you know, I remember one of the reasons why Coach Holland ended up leaving is because kids tuned him out. So as a head coach, Every ladder, every every rung up the ladder you go, it's a different set of challenges. For sure. And you got to realize what you went through and, and what it taught you. I hope you never forget because yep. it is about that. It's oh, not about the win. And I think that's one of the big things, right? As, as a coach, we should be learning too. And I, I think I learned something yeah. every every season with whatever team I have, you know, even with my club teams. And I, I love it. You know, I – do you know – I don't know if you even know – do you know Coach K, though, over at Duke? Have you ever run into him? I've had a chance to sit on it. In fact, I wanted to – you started talking about uh, coaching, and I, I was glancing to see if I could find it. I've got one of his books here. He talks about the coaching experience of the Olympic team when he had uh, – I think it was Michael. And, and it's, he has 12 Krzyzewski, um commandments. It's a phenomenal book. I want, to, I want to recommend it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you afterwards because I don't want to leave my chair and go grab it, but I refer to it a lot. It's you know, a great thing, coaching book. You know, one thing I love about so I'm not a big Duke fan, but I'm a huge Coach K fan, which you know, for some people may sound weird. I'm a UNC fan. Okay. So I can't root for Duke, but I absolutely <laughs> love Coach K. I think he's probably one of the best coaches we're ever going to see at the college level mm-hmm. for sports in no general, question. not just basketball. No question. And you can just see, like, the kids he brings in, and he invests in those guys. Like, he makes them better. He develops them. He gets them right. If they're going to go play pro, well, they're getting better. Like, Zion. Dude, Zion couldn't shoot the ball to save his life until he got to Duke. And I'm not saying he's a great shooter now. But he was shooting and hitting shots at yes. Duke. When LeBron was making that decision – there was the only. There was only one place he was thinking about going. Had he stayed in, co- had he gone to college, it was Duke. Yeah. You got Kyrie Irving who went there. There's a reason why he attracts those high caliber players. There's a reason why he had success with the egos, the professional egos, coaching the Olympic team. You know, there's yeah, no, there's no, there's no, there's no secret there. Stuff. Like everybody gives that guy all the respect in the world. Yeah. And it's because of how he coaches, right? Yes. Like, he developed that reputation, I, I think, as a – West Point. For sure. West Point. For sure. Very influential in his life. And, you know, Bob Knight was mm-hmm. a great coach and was his coach and mentor as well. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a uh, – you know, I, I don't know where my journey is going to take me, right? I'm, I'm figuring it out as I go as far as, like, you know, my – I have – due to the coronavirus, I've had some big things happen in my life and, and some big changes. Mm. And I'm kind of going through my own 
journey of what am I, go how is life going to look for me when this is all over? Right? Like, what am I going to funnel my energy into? Cause That's the reality question. is some of my businesses are done now. That's just the reality of it. They're, they're closed. They're, it is what it is. And now I'm starting some yeah. new ventures, but it's, you know, part of the challenge I go through right now is, 70% of my time is focused on my daughter, which is awesome because I get to be a dad. I love being a dad. She is frustrating me at times, but at least I get to focus a lot of my time with her. Yep. Um, even though I do need to focus time on getting all my work done, like I just have literally on my kitchen table downstairs sheets of to do's right now. And every time I'm like, dude, I'm going to start my day off right. I get up early. I get up at like 6 a.m. because I don't have anywhere to go. So I get up, get a little workout <laughs> in, have, you know, I make breakfast for Scarlett and Tara. And then I'm like, I'm just going to crush work. <laughs> well, by the time I'm like ready to get into my work, Scarlett's woken up or my wife's woken up. You know, it's just like now I have to start, you know, and then I get to like two o'clock and I'm beating my head into a wall because now I'm like, no, my day is slipping through my fingers. Now I have, da -da 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 -da. you know, it's just like now I have all these other things I got to do. And then I get to, you know, it's eight o'clock at night and I'm just like sitting there with my all right let's just turn on tv like at this point my day is over hopefully it's teaching us how to adapt and adjust for because sure coaching is all about adapting and adjusting for sure your teams are adaptable and they can adjust through the timeouts or in between periods you're going to probably be pretty successful so again look at this time in the form of a gift because they're sure. there we just need to look for them now, some of them are going to be harder to find, For depending sure. on your circumstances, okay? Um, but we, we have to, because otherwise, um, you're holding on to stuff that is out of our control, yeah. which well, doesn't serve us. Let me ask you this, because I, I know, I've, and I just thank you so much for your time. I really no, my pleasure. It, you know, and and I, uh, I've actually mentioned you in a previous uh, podcast um, when we were doing mental health and stuff, just because you're, for me... You know, I, I don't know if I ever vocalized this to you, but I look up to you as a as a mentor for myself in in some very specific ways. Thank and you. I really value and appreciate the relationship I have with you, which is also why I love having you with my teams, and why I'm always like, look, I don't care what you cost, just whatever it is, because I every time I'm with you, I take away so much. And I mean, you've been working with my program, my high school boys, now for a few years. Every time I hear you speak, I take away so many new things. Mm. And a lot of times it's the, the base of the conversation is the same, but the, the way that you approach it differently every year is, or, you know, the two times, you know, the only years we get two or three times with you. Um, I just learn so much and I take Thank away you. so much and I really, really value nice. that. And, you know, I would just, kind of to wrap things up here, say, you know, for the, for the athletes listening to this, for the parents listening to this, what would be the one or two bits of information you'd want to impart on them that they can take from this and is applicable to life as sports at some point in the near future kind of reopen and how to, you know, I say like maybe one for the parents and one for the players, yeah. just something that you can say to them that's going to, they can take this and say, cool, I got something I can now apply for my career here i can take this and i can run with this and this will help me in bettering my situation take a breath seriously because because i think when times are tough when there's uncertainty when there's fear um we get tight we're all living in confined quarters so we're on top of each other. We're not used to spending this much time with each other. We're getting on each other's nerves, you know? And um, we got to take a step back and start realizing these are moments for us to grow, to learn, to reinvest in each other, in ourselves. I did a, po I did, uh, you know, I did a little, t what I called 20 for 20, 20 minutes for 20 days. Okay. Or with the challenge more for myself, but I thought, all right, if I'm going to take ownership of this, I got to put this out there. And I did it as a way of reminding myself, I need to reinvest in me mm -hmm. so that the quality of who I am continues to grow mm -hmm. in every role that I take on. 
as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as a sports psychology consultant, as a professor and teacher, as a mentor, I, I need, it's, it has to start with me. Right. And if not now, when? I mean, my God, we've got so much time now. There's no <laughs> excuse. Right. So I think we need to take a step back and not allow the excuses to bring us down. Let's let this inform us and give us a reason for why we need to do X and Y and Z. Okay. So reinvest in who we are, reinvest in our relationships, um, reevaluate what it is that we're here to do, okay? If we have kids who are athletes, let them, remember, they're kids, let them play. If they're really going to be successful, they got to play. They have to have that air of detachment where I care, but I don't care. Right. Because when you do that, you're, they're going to be risk takers. So if you want to encourage and nurture that, you can't be all about this and that. And everything is all on the line. No, sports doesn't work that way. Certainly not at the younger level, no. And even then, as a pro, everything's not on the line. One play doesn't make or break you. It may get you a hell of a bonus in the Super Bowl, but it doesn't make or break you. So you got to learn to become resilient. So this is an opportunity for all of us to learn how to become more resilient. And, you know, starts with the breath, starts with taking care of ourselves, reinvesting who we are, and then look to reinvest in your relationship with the people you love. You take care of that, all that other stuff out there becomes so much easier because we're modeling how we should be approaching stuff. Well, that's great. I love it. That's great advice. It's the advice I'll be taking for myself too. I need to take a breath sometimes. Man. <laughs> we all do, breath. man. We, we, we all do, myself included. But when you do, it, put, you know, and it helps slow the game down. Yeah, you're right. It does. You know, you know, we make better coaching decisions. We make better parenting decisions. Um, we can stay engaged in, a, in an uncomfortable conversation with somebody who's a little, being a little salty with us and, and not feel like, all right, this is really going to keep getting amped up because this could person pissed me off. Yeah. yeah. Let's call it verbal judo. Let me just stay in it, you know, and, this, and just be calm. Yeah. I don't know what that person just went through. Yeah, I always try to make sure, you know, I always tell my kids, don't talk to the refs, man, I will. And I'm really big on like, when I talk to a ref, I'm always very respectful, Yeah. watch my tone. And if I'm upset, I take a quick breath real fast. I always make sure I'm like, all right, my heartbeat needs to be at a certain space before good I for you. Because if my heartbeat's going too fast, and I feel my blood pressure. I know it's just, yeah. there might be some sparring going on. So I just, but there's things too, I know all these refs for the most part. You know, most of them I, I know outside you of see them all the time. Right. Yeah. Because I see them all the time. And I and I like, you know, we'll do I go to different clinics, maybe I'm speaking, maybe I'm a, a person there, but some of them are there too. You know, but I know these guys on a personal level now too. So I'm always like, right. But if I don't know them and they're being real aggravating to the situation, <laughs> I'm just like, all right, you know, I try really carefully, just be respectful, talk to them politely, don't get upset. I've only lost my temper, you know, and you'll be proud of me. Cause I used to get into verbal sparring matches with refs uh -huh. often. My entire high school season with Calvary this year, which for those who don't know, I, I coach club, I don't coach high school. I, I did it this year for the first time uh, for a variety of reasons that don't matter right now. I only had one altercation, verbal altercation with a ref, the whole season. And I, I'm proud of myself because there were some games I was like, oh, what are you, what, what game are you watching? <laughs> but I told my kids, it's not the ref's fault. We take ownership of ourselves. The game, Good. you know, four Good. eight minute quarters. The refs didn't ruin all four eight minute quarters. And yeah. objectively, they don't, right? They're not there ruining our game. Did they make some questionable calls or non calls? Yes, but they're people too. So I use it as teachable moments for my kids. There's only one ref, man. Oh, I, I actually couldn't even talk to him after a certain point. I had to go talk to his partner multiple times and call his partner. Right. Like, dude, I can't talk to him because it's just this, this sinking ship. And I was like, look, and it was a ref that has ref games before. I didn't really know that well, but he had ref a couple of my games. I'm like, look, man, the games that you've ref for me, have I ever spoken to you? He's like, uh, outside of say, saying hi, thank you for being here. We appreciate you. And then telling you what a great game you ref afterward. Yeah. Have I spoken? He's like, no. 
It's okay. So you understand that that's the kind of coach I'm. And I've always told you too, if my kids talk to you, you let me know and I will punish them. They're not allowed to talk to you guys, except for telling you guys, thank you. Great job. Or if they have a legitimate question, they may ask, but you can tell me if that was disrespectful the way they did or whatever, you know, we're, we're on those terms. I'm like, okay. And my kids are respectful. We've never had an issue. The whole year, we had no issues with the kids. So I said, look, you know, help me out here. Like, your partner is doing such a trash job. I want to Bobby Knight this place, dude. I want to take chairs, start throwing them, breaking things. Like, he's getting me. I can feel my blood pressure going up. I'm like, it's not supposed to be that way. Like, look, it's just not – he's just not doing – just can you please have him be consistent? Okay? Have him already be consistently <laughs> crappy, then have him be consistently crappy on both sides of the court. Right. Just have them be consistent one way or another. I don't care which way it is. Just consistency is all I'm asking for. He's like, yeah, no worries. So we talked for him and he was great. He went over to his partner, talked to his partner. I think he was just consistently crappy the rest of the game, but it's just like, dude. But, 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 so, so we all go through this. I, and then I'm going to throw this, I'm going to throw this out tongue in cheek. What do you think his partner really said to him? He probably said this coach is going to come on the court and strangle you if you don't <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, and I know it's a lot easier said than done because I've been in your shoes. Um, I don't think they're trying to be shitty on purpose. Oh, I agree. But, but, but there's they time. can only do what they're capable of doing. For sure. Now, shame on them that they don't take the kind of pride that they should. Right. But at the end of the day, here's another gift. Yeah. It's a reminder yep. for us to focus on what we have control of. Yep. And that's, we need to keep coaching our players. 100%. You know, and, and what that ref, I, I highly doubt he told him I was going to choke him out. He, but he probably said, hey, look, you know, the coach is being frustrated with what's going on. You know, can you try and make sure you're just being balanced in your, in your calling, right? I'm sure, or, you know, something to that effect. Um, you know, and I've had to talk to refs. Obviously, you know, I host tournaments, and there's times I got to go talk to refs too. I'm like, listen, yeah. man, look, I'm sitting here watching, and I'm actually seeing the same thing. Because if, if a parent's just being chippy, and I'm like, look, I'm literally sitting here watching this game with you, yep. but be objective. They're not after your kid. They're making calls both ways. Look at the foul count on the clock. Like, you know, it's, it's seven to six. It's one difference. Like, it's, they're, they're not making the same calls both ways, and they're making the same calls both ways. No. Um, for me, I'm, and that's why I'm like, look, the refs are going to call, how are they going to call? I, a lot of times I'm learning how they're going to call a game too when they're doing it. And then we adjust based on the refs. And I tell my kids, like, play this way and then we'll adjust. But, um, you know, look, I get it. Refs are humans. Don't abuse them. You should never, you, should, you know, for those of you watching, you should never get into an altercation with the ref. Let the coaches It'll talk never to serve you. You it just sit and you you. Just be a cheerleader. But as a coach, you know, I just have to, you know, for myself, I also remember, like, I have ref games before, just so we're on the same page, and I did it reluctantly. A ref didn't show up to a tournament, and I had to ref a couple of games. It is tough. You it is. can only do so much. No and, you know, you have one pair of eyes, and so you can only see one thing. You know, as a coach, I can see the floor because of where I'm standing and I'm looking at multiple things, right? And I also know my own kids, so I have a base understanding of what's going on. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, it is tough, man. And there's – I've had – I could talk about ref stories all day. I've had a couple of refs that have definitely singled me out. You know, color was definitely – I'm a white guy. They definitely made me understand that I'm – They're human, man. They're but, human. you know, it was – there was no point in me getting – and I got into a verbal altercation with both of them, and it didn't change anything. The best part oh, of exactly. is I had nine kids. I had seven kids foul out. I had – 40 plus fouls through the game. The other team didn't get one foul call on them until the last minute of the game, which we were still ahead with only two kids. I was ahead until the last 30 seconds of the game. We lost by one point. I was definitely. You need, you, that, that's a Disney movie. But that was <laughs> early in my coaching career. This is when I first started and I was that's real funny. chippy. If things weren't going well, because like you, I'm a black and white guy. It's yeah. either right or it's wrong. So, and I'm, you know, I get, I get, I get real a lot sick. of the world isn't. Yeah. So I've, I've definitely matured over the years of coaching and, and brought it back to just focus on your team. It's not worth, but dude, I've seen coaches and refs get in fights, like physical oh, yeah. altercations. And it's terrible because at the right. end of the day, 
nobody wins. Nobody Actually, wins. We lose. In fact, oh, we yeah. all lose. All, we all lose. The sport loses. You know, yes. you've got to be able to keep it in a verbal context and not going where you shouldn't go either. we got to stay human, man. 100%. Not go subhuman. Well, you know, and that's yeah. the one thing I think that this, you know, I hate keep bringing up the coronavirus, but I think the one thing, you know, that I've personally noticed and I will wrap it up here because I said I was going to wrap it up earlier. But it, I think it's really improved human to human interaction. You're so much more. I hope so. To people. I agree. Like the few times that I've actually had to go out to get stuff, I have noticed that people are really treating each other with a different level of care and respect, and I think even understanding because we're all in this boat together now. I hope so. And people and I, and I have hope been. It stays there. At least in my area, right? I saw the. The, the panic buying and people fighting over toilet paper. But now that that whole ship has, I think, sailed, you know, it is nice to see that people are actually taking the opportunity to actually really be accommodating. Like I'm at the dog park. Well, it's not a dog park. I'm at the park with my dogs. And when people come up, you know, they are, they're very quick to put their dogs on a leash, not because they're, they're worried about some sort of altercation with dogs, but they, they don't want to have like, you know, they're respectful of the fact that yeah. we're doing this distance thing. And so they'll wait from across the field or they'll say hi, you know, 20 feet mm -hmm. away. But it's really, it's really been refreshing to see people being so um, positive through this, which I've really enjoyed. Amen. But anyways, Amen. my brother, I love you so much. And I appreciate you taking the time you have to be here with me. This is Steven and you're on my podcast, Get It. And please make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, please like, yeah. subscribe. Let us know what you thought, please. Yeah, and we'd love to. And, and for those of you who have engaged with me on my Instagram, keep it coming. I love engaging with you guys. And again, if you want to engage with us on YouTube. And Mario, what's your Instagram for people to reach out to you if they want to ask questions? You can reach me at Mario Sports Doc. Um, and that's across the board. Uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. Am I missing anything? Facebook. So yeah, on pretty much all of those. But <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Have a wonderful and safe rest of your day. Stay healthy. And as soon as this coronavirus stuff is over, you'll be getting a call from me because I do have a couple of new high school teams I want you to speak to. And I I did change things up. I didn't take the. I took six teams last year for boys. I cut it down to two this year to just maintain sanity and focus. It's all on good, man. Guys. So it's all good. At least you're still doing it. Yeah, they all, and I, this will be a good group of guys for you to work with. So I appreciate you, my man. You're welcome. Likewise. God bless right. you and your family. You too. Thank you. All right, bud. Bye. Bye. Bye.